Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's presentation on invasive plants in Pinellas County. I hope that's what you signed up for, because that's what we're about to do. And stick around, because we're going to talk about some of the things, some of the plants that have been turned loose on our tiny little county. My name is James Stevenson. I'm with the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences right here in Pinellas County. We're a cooperative with the local government between the university and the local government. Together, we provide information for the citizens in this county through avenues like these webinars, but we have all kind of other outreach capabilities. Um, to provide research-based information to the citizens of this county. And in these days of webinars surrounding counties um, to help citizens make choices, make decisions about the lifestyle that they want to have. How can they achieve the lifestyle that they crave without having any negative and potentially expensive problems for our local government? probably best known for giving horticultural advice. What not to plant so it doesn't get loose and become an invasive species. Thus, the kind of presentation that we do today. But also information on how to properly apply herbicides and pesticides and when you might not need to at all. The improper application of these kinds of things can lead to expensive problems down the line. So you kind of see how we shoehorn into uh, giving free advice, being a good and worthwhile institute here in the county, and also having a little hidden agenda preventing expensive problems. I'm coming to you from our largest preserve in Pinellas County. Again, we are a tiny little county. We're 98% built, so we're 98% paved. Uh, and a preserve like ours up here called Brooker Creek Preserve, 9,000 acres of undeveloped land, which is not left to its own devices. Preserving land, setting it aside for the plants and animals that are native to this area, does take watching after. And it does take allowing natural fires to burn because the plants and animals here in this part of Florida are adapted to burning. They need it for a healthy ecosystem. Fire needs to come through. So preserving land and then keeping all the fire out isn't really doing any favors. Preserving land and not actively addressing invasive plants that have found their way into the preserve is also not helping. So there's a lot of, well, there's a certain amount of input into allowing the preserve to exist as nature intended, as, as um, counterintuitive as that seems, um, because of human activity, we have to keep our eye on natural processes and allow those natural processes like fire and perhaps flooding, that sort of thing, to happen. We also have to address the unnatural um, forces that might be acting negatively towards a preserve area by addressing things like the invasive plant. So we have all these wonderful ecosystems here in the preserve, in our 9,000 acres, where 50% upland, which includes landscapes like this, the oak hammock, which if left to its own devices without the arrival of uh, Europeans would look something like this with a canopy of oak trees and understory of a herbaceous layer, a shrub layer, and in some cases a palmetto layer, pine flatwoods are a type of habitat dominated by guests the pine trees, and again, the understory of the saw palmettos, uh, these plants are adapted to regular fires and they require those fires. Uh, and our wetland areas, our swamps, um, our cedar, nope, cypress swamps, cypress depressions, um, 
all in harmony, blah de blah de blah, right? Enter the invasive plants, and everything gets turned on its head. Um, and the invasive plants very extremely rarely arrive into a, an area completely on their own. In this photograph, we have a plant that's called air potato. Air potato did not find its way from Asia to the Southeast US on its own. It had help, it was brought, it was intentionally cultivated and it got loose. Technically, it escaped from cultivation. That's the terminology that's actually used. These plants escape from cultivation and they become established in our natural areas. Some plants that have been introduced from a different place become established and don't cause any problems at all. And they're not considered invasive. They're considered exotic, yes, but until they start showing problems, they might be referred to as an established exotic, not invasive just an established exotic. The invasive plants, they get to be on a list. They get to be infamous. They get to be represented on the list that land managers use, educators use, uh, the agricultural community pays attention to, and it's put together by what used to be called the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council, FLEPSI. Uh, and FLEPSI occasionally puts out these lists of invasive plants. Um, FLEPSI is now referred to as FISC, F-I-S-C, the Florida Invasive Species Council. Nice, Florida Invasive Species Council. And this list that's published, the most recent one was in 2019. Unfortunately, plants are added much more often than they're taken off of this list. But this list, as I mentioned, that is used by land managers, is used by the agricultural community, is used by decision makers to help concentrate efforts and make decisions. This list is not regulatory. This list is compiled by various individuals and organizations together. This isn't one person's opinion. This list is compiled by, uh, you can see, right, let me grab my pointer, let me grab a laser pointer, even more fun. Um, the FLEPSI, or now FISC, committee. And this committee is made up of individuals from across a spectrum. They're all experts in plant communities, natural areas, plant identification, botany, all these things. They've all had their eyes out. They don't work together until they get together as a part of this committee to decide based on their experiences, by the data that's being brought in from the field through various different channels, collecting all this data on the spread and the impact of certain species uh, proving their invasiveness. So it's not a regulatory list. And that I mean, sadly, there's not a, an invasive plant police. When we have these prohibited plants, the noxious plants, and the category one and two invasive plants, there are only about four or five of these species that are actually regulated. You can't possess 
transport, propagate, um, encourage the use of. There's there's only a few that are that bad, or at least have raised themselves above above the parapet that much that they have become actually prohibited and noxious, and they require attention. The category one and the category two species, those are the ones that are more um, on a very local level and by individual land managers targeted for eradication. The committee in, includes individuals from University of Florida, the water management districts, as I mentioned. These are all institutions and individuals that have an interest in and an experience with natural areas and can collect and share the data about the movement and establishment of various species of plants that have shown themselves to be invasive. So what makes a plant invasive? It probably doesn't take much of a stretch of the imagination. Um, what, makes a con what makes a plant considered to be invasive? And, and what are the consequences of a plant becoming invasive? Now, what makes a plant invasive? Obviously, it's growing faster than the surrounding plants. It's overgrowing the surrounding plants. Um, it's reproducing at a rate that's far exceeding any sort of um, available environmental control. It can reproduce itself more than the offspring might die in a frost. It might reproduce itself faster than any native uh, herbivores could eat it to death. It, it's outpacing the native herbivores, um, perhaps even a fire tolerance where we have in this part of Florida natural wild fires that come through our native flora completely adapted to it. Many non-native species get wiped out by that, but some might be able to survive that and then they can continue to reproduce. So you get the idea of what makes a plant invasive. Now, what are the consequences of this? I've just listed a few. I'm sure, you know, given a few minutes, you could come up with these ideas yourself. Um, just the effect that a non-native species that's out competing all of the other local flora in a particular area is going to have a negative effect on the body overall biodiversity. If you have one species of vine that grows over and shades out and subsequently kills 10 species, 10 other species of plants, you've lost diversity there. The percentage of plant cover on a given area is going to be 80% one species and 20% everything else. See what I'm saying? This can lead to, of course, habitat loss. Once you lose the different species of plants, you're going to lose um, those other wildlife, the other wildlife, the other native species that might depend on that plant. Um, endangered species, I mean, they have it hard enough. They've already lost their habitat through development, and now they're getting shaded out by an invasive plant. Just insult to injury, right? There's a cost to plant management. And when I tell you that even in the preserve, the land managers have to keep on top of these invasive exotic plants, there's a cost to that. We have to pay people to do that. And there is controversy, of course, around some of the methods that are used to control with the view to eradicating these non-native plant species. Um, and it's through lack, it's, it's our fault if we don't get ahead, as educators, if we don't get ahead of these efforts and explain how there's a toolbox with a dozen different tools that can be used to address 
aggressive, invasive species. There's a toolbox. And within that toolbox, there's a couple of things that have some pretty bad press. And even though they're not the only thing that's used, when that particular method comes up, it's a trigger. And in the absence of education as to why this tool was chosen in this particular instance, it, it, it's only the controversy. It only becomes the controversy. So that can cause problems. And of course, when you change a landscape by introducing a plant that's going to completely knock the ecosystem on its ear, things like drainage can be affected. You know, water, which used to flow in a particular area, might be rechanneled because of the presence of a non-native species of plant that's, you know, standing its ground. And fire could find its way into ecosystems that wouldn't naturally be burned. Some of those wetter areas, these invasive plants might bring the fire to a, an area that would have previously been off limits. So you get the idea of the interest in invasive plants on a larger scale, more than just, I've got a problem with a weed in my yard. This thing is growing too fast. It's, I can't keep up with it. Ramp that up into our natural areas, including our parks and preserves and all kind of public areas. You can see why this is a particular issue. And it's by educating the public on what these species are helps empower the public to do what they can in their own sphere of influence to prevent the release, the escape of these species and can help educate the citizens to get involved where they can be useful and to help spread an educated, a research-based argument for the use of one or another tool to control these species because of the cost associated and the negative effects on our wild areas. Does that make sense? I think that makes sense. Now let's get into some of the species. And this is by no means an exhaustive list of the invasive species in Pinellas County. We're going to put a link to the FISC list, which is now online, which is great. It has become more like a database that you can search links to photographs, links to fact sheets. You can really teach yourself a little bit better than having that threefold in your hand that comes out every four years with the scientific names. The online version is much more useful and we'll share that with you in the chat so you can go right to that and learn more about the individual species. So this is not an exhaustive list. What I decided to focus on in this presentation are those species that you can still purchase online or even down the street at a big box store or even a mom and pop nursery. Because the FISC list is not regulatory and because the majority of these plants are not noxious or federally prohibited, they haven't been recognized and it's not illegal to grow and sell them. So it's our job not to yell at the nurserymen. That's not going to help. Reduce the demand. Encourage the use of non-invasive and very oftentimes native plants in landscapes and so on. Let's take a look at some of the things that you can still buy that are invasive. They're on the list. They're categorized. This flowering plant, which is called a fern, even though it's not because it's a flowering plant, it's actually an asparagus. It's in the genus asparagus. Yes, you can probably eat it. Um, I think if it were a viable nutritional 
sustainable crop species that it would be grown as such. It's called the asparagus fern, asparagus ethiopicus. It gives you an idea of where it's from, East Africa. Uh, it's a flowering plant. You can see the white flowers in the photograph above. All flowers develop into fruit. Many fruit are edible. And in this case, the asparagus fern creates this red berry that could be very toxic to a lot of things, but it's not toxic to birds. And they love to eat those berries and fly off with the seeds in their belly and go over there and you can just imagine what happens next. Asparagus fern seeds get planted over there and the cycle continues. So asparagus fern, you can still buy. Yes, that foxtail cultivar that looks like pipe cleaners, um, that counts. That's, all, that's the same species. It's just a different growth mutant that has been cloned. Um, it produces these viable seeds inside these red fruit that are desirable for the birds. So it's feeding birds. It can't be a bad thing. Cost, benefit, the cost outweighs any benefit to wildlife. The wild tarot. I myself, in a former life, as a horticultural practitioner, horticulture practitioner uh, in North Carolina, where I was doing, you know, ornamental, ornamental horticulture, making things pretty, pretty for rich people for a long time. I myself spent a lot of money on the tropical look, and I purchased Colocasia esculenta, the wild taro, to grow in containers in rich people's patios to give that tropical look during the summer. Here in Florida, it's loose, loosey-goosey, and it is disrupting our wetlands because nothing will eat it. Um, members of this family of plants, their leaves are full of defensive chemicals that keep them from being eaten, and they will actually uh, chemically burn anything that tries to eat it. They will, the oxalic acid, the oxalates will cut and burn the mucous membranes of anything that tries to eat them. You can even get a rash just handling these things, these elephant ears. Um, and just today, I just did a quick little search. I'm not gonna leave this slide up too long because I don't wanna, you know, thumbs down a particular business. That's not what I'm here for, but I'm just underscoring. You can spend some money on just one little nub to get this thing started, where in our waterways, we're paying 300 times this per acre to try and get rid of the dang thing. So again, we don't have regulation. All we have at this point is education. Lantana, everybody with the butterfly garden has to have a lantana. It flowers year round. It feeds the butterflies year round. It's a nice cheery color. Sometimes you get hummingbirds on it. There, there is at least one reason, and more often there are 10 to 12 very good reasons. But the plants that we're talking about today have been brought into cultivation. They have a lot going for them. They, they are very pleasing to us as horticultural objects. They're easy to take care of. They don't have any pests or disease. They live forever. You can't kill them. They flower all the time. They've got all this going for them. There's no, there's every reason why these things have been brought into cultivation. They were not brought into cultivation for nefarious reasons. And the people who grow them are not bad people. We're not gonna go out and yell at our neighbors today, are we? No, that's not gonna, that's not how this works. Lantana is a very old fashioned plant. It's definitely been in cultivation for quite a long time, but unfortunately it has become established and where it grows, where it has become established in our natural areas, it is causing a negative effect. It's not feeding enough. 
of our wildlife. As much of a butterfly magnet as it is, and as wonderful as that might be in your neighborhood, that doesn't help fulfill an entire niche out here in the woods. It has a negative effect. And its dispersal is the same way as that asparagus fern that we saw before. It's a flowering plant. Flowers turn into fruit. Many fruit are edible. The fruit of this thing is edible, again, by birds, probably poisonous to a lot of other things, but birds love it. And they take the seeds and plant them over there and they get established. The Boston fern, again, you can't kill it. It'll grow anywhere. Sunshade, wet, dry, bomb proof, has a lot going for it as a landscape plant. All those pluses then tip the scale towards negative. And this is a picture that we took, the, the larger picture, the background picture is a, one that we took at a, at a Pinellas County Park where, again, not bad people, not evil people, not anyone with, a, with an agenda, planted this Boston fern, this sword fern, at the little nature center, at the little welcome center, because it was so easy to grow, it didn't need water, we're saving water, we're helping the environment, we're saving water, right? We're gonna plant this Boston fern because you don't have to... Well-meaning, but it turns out that this is one of those plants that just grows at the expense of everything else. There's nothing natural here in this part of Florida to stop it. This one's sometimes called the tuberous sword fern, because when you pull up the plants, and we recommend that you do if you have this properly identified, you'll find these little occasional tubers. Um, they get to be about a quarter the size of a golf ball. Um, helps them through drought. Helps them grow in sandy soil. Uh, gives them the edge. Gives them the ability to outcompete a lot of um, a lot of other understory plants. So again, this one you can buy in a basket and you can hang it on your front porch and it can wilt a hundred times and you can bring it right back to life. It's bomb proof. Nothing's gonna stop this one from growing. The photograph in the background here, um, this is the Mexican petunia. And I think every Publix in Pinellas County has got Mexican petunia growing in one of those horrible little concrete circles in the middle of the parking lot. Can you think of a worse environment to try and grow? And they're just thriving. They're thriving on the neglect, on the heat, on the runoff, the gasoline, the people pouring stuff out of their cups in the car when they get somewhere, you know, onto the dirt. Um, doesn't bother the Mexican petunia. And this one has found its way into our natural areas and it is become no fault of its own, but it has become a thug. Impenetrable. Um, it might be good for some nectar. Doesn't seem to have any foliar pests, doesn't seem to have any natural controls. Its roots are extraordinarily deep underground, making control, physical control, digging this thing out, very difficult. Um, it's so deep underground that it could probably survive fire. You know, even if you had a blowtorch and zapped it, you know, enough of it underground could survive to resprout. So this one's one that needs a lot of attention to er finally eradicate uh, many of these plants when we're talking about control you can't just pull them up and walk away a week later there's going to be two where that one was pulling isn't going to work you could spray it with an herbicide and that's going to knock it down maybe 30 percent a few weeks later you got to go back and hit that the remaining 60%. And again, and again, until you have finally exhausted all the stored up resources. It's tough. It's really, really tough. Making it a wonderful landscape plan. But these characteristics, once it's escaped, lots of negative effects. There is 
a reported sterile cultivar, one or two, even produced by the University of Florida, because the University of Florida, of course, lends its support to the agricultural community, including the ornamental plant industry. And so the efforts that are poured into the development of landscape plants, um, they're supported, they're sponsored, uh, the tests are done, uh, these cultivars are proven to be sterile, they're given a name, they're touted, there's advertising, there's you know, media, this is a sterile cultivar, don't worry, this isn't going to become invasive, it's not going to get loose, it's sterile, you can grow this one in your garden. That's great. And I believe it, because I believe when the university says we have run these through the trials, that they got it right. Scientists, they got no agenda other than making sure their data is right. However, the similarity to the fertile species, this Ruellia simplex, the similarity might be very difficult for someone who didn't spend years doing the research. So we have all this free advertisement for this sterile Mexican petunia. And it could be really cheap and really easy to sneak in there at the Publix late at night and dig some up and put them in a pot and bring it to your garden center and say, look, here's the sterile one. And we're charging extra for it because it's the sterile one. The customer trusting the advertisement, trusting the hype, then introduces that invasive species. Now we're talking about somebody with bad intentions someone who's trying to work around but do you see how this can go so instead of choosing a what's referred to as a sterile cultivar of a problematic plant don't risk it there are plenty of other plants to grow in your garden and we'll give you a link to some choices that are vetted through the non-native uh, non-invasive lens this one the, the, the lowly wax begonia, the cheap and cheerful annual plant that you can just buy by the two dozen, plant out in a big bare area. It's going to cheer up that bare area all season long. You can toss them at the end of the year because they're cheap as chips. The wax begonia has become showing up, has begun showing up in our natural areas, especially shady and kind of damp, kind of our wetland areas, kind of like around here at Brooker Creek. This is one of the category two. Everything that we have seen hitherto has been the category one, the really bad, that you need to spend some money to stop these plants in their tracks. This is a category two, which means we've got our eye on you. You are showing signs of becoming an ecosystem disruptor. Wax begonia is one of those species. And with summers getting warmer, hotter, literally, and longer, you know, our warm seasons are becoming warmer and they're becoming longer. We might be getting more and more rainfall and more intense storms. This is not controversial, that's just a fact. Uh, species like this might then have just what they need to tip from being a category two into a category one and really starting to show a negative impact on natural areas when i was a little kid first grade my first grade teacher miss hackinson hankinson had one of these growing outside her classroom uh, in clearwater bel air elementary and I was absolutely fascinated by it because it had these weird scalloped leaves and little tiny plants would start to grow out of each one of those little dimples on the side of the leaf. And I thought that was the coolest thing. So of course I had to take one home and experiment with it and it grew 
and it didn't you know every single one of the little plants that sprouted along that the leaf margin here grew into when my parents sold their house whatever that was 45 years later there was still that life plant thriving in the very dry shade underneath the overhang of a house in sand tough sometimes this plant is called mother of millions for a reason millions so this was introduced as a very hard to kill evergreen herbaceous low growing interesting kind of a novelty plant that you could give to your friend and say here take this home you can grow a hundred little plants for nothing you see how these things can get established and get 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 loose Wedelia is a ground cover a very popular ground cover again it ticks all the boxes for a fantastic landscape plant for central Florida. It doesn't mind drought. It doesn't mind flooding. It doesn't mind searing heat. It doesn't mind getting pretty darn cold. Uh, it attracts butterflies. You can even see a little skipper butterfly right there. Uh, it's evergreen. It's got shiny leaves. No bugs eat it. Blah. A lot going for it. It, too, like the Mexican petunia and everything we've mentioned before, has found its way into our natural areas and it is an absolute thug out competing anything in its path growing faster overtaking shading out out competing just making a natural ecosystem untenable for the native species this one thrives in those islands in the middle of major thoroughfares, roadways, you know, the kind of places that don't ever get anything except abuse, these things are thriving. So again, there are alternatives. There are alternatives to all of the plants that we have just seen. Let's look at a few vines. And of course, air potato does not need any introduction we've all heard of it it's no longer used as an ornamental it's definitely worth recognizing properly um, you'll notice that the extremely heart-shaped leaves have got this kind of in, uh, pronounced what's called a drip tip that helps the water drip off the leaves it has the unmistakable golf ball to larger sized propagules that are attached to the stems as it grows uh, anyone who needs help identifying this there's lots of resources available to help identify and make sure you, what you have is air potato this is one that became such a problem and there was the chance of uh, developing a natural predator and releasing that predator where this natural predator from where it's from in Asia developing this and releasing it as a biological control that the money was spent the research was done the I's were dotted the T's were crossed the season after season after season these uh, biological control agents in this case a beetle they were tested on other species to make sure they didn't have a preference once they get out into the world for perhaps our native potato vines yes we have native potato vines yes they are very much a part of the ecosystems where they are native to in the same genus um, and it was proven that the air potato beetle that was reared cultured in the lab only and only only ate this particular species of air potato the dioscorea bulbifera the bulb bearing dioscorea and they've now become established 
They are established in Florida. They haven't jumped species. They can overwinter and reemerge in the spring and get to work again. Their effectiveness is something like 70%. They're really good at their little job. And hopefully one day they'll eat their self out of a job and all the non-native air potato will be gone. Hopefully. Um, the Florida Depart the FDAX, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, took over the air potato project. It used to be uh, the University of Florida. They did the research. They conducted the very first trials, releases of the air potato beetle. And you could actually send a note to the University of Florida to this lab and say, send me a vial of these things. I've got an infestation of air potato. And they would send you some live beetles and you could check them out on your infestation. Well, now that project is still going. However, it's being handled by FDAX. There's going to be, a, again, a link in the chat uh, to more about that program and how to be a part of it. They've stopped sending out beetles for now. Um, they've start, they've, they're now providing beetles for adjacent states because the lily beetle is considered established in Florida. But when they get the money and the staff and the resources, they'll ramp up the beetle rearing again. Uh, for now, FDAX is collecting information on where the infestations are. So you can be a citizen science and report through the FDAX website, through the FDAX portal, FDACS, about local infestations so that those areas writ large, not just your yard, but perhaps your entire uh, neighborhood or, or county, could be next on the list to get a distribution of lily beetles. This cute little thing that everybody gets when they go to the hospital and a little dish of mixed plants. One of them is one of these little arrowhead vine things. Sometimes they're little flushed with pink horrors. When you get it home, you're feeling better, so glad. You put this out on the deck and it grows and it sends out a little runner. And as soon as that runner touches the ground, this thing, Jekyll and Hyde, it turns into this monster vine that will race across the yard, undetected or unbothered by the lawnmower. And when it finds its first vertical surface, up it goes using modified roots to cling on to whatever vertical surface they can find. The leaves change morphology and get a lot bigger. And up it goes into the canopy of your tree, this arrowhead vine, Syngonium. It can become so huge, so massive, and so heavy, it could bring entire tree branches down. This one has a variegated cousin, which you probably recognize. Again, just like you get the arrowhead when you go to the hospital in a little dish garden, when you go to the doctor's office, there's one of these. Sometimes it's just growing in a cup of manky water that's been sat there for months and perhaps years, and it's just thriving inside. And they've circled the room three times with it, you know, putting it on little hooks. Uh, outdoors where it gets loose, it has the same propensity to hit the ground and literal, almost literally run until it finds a vertical surface. The leaves change by an order of magnitude into these huge, huge leaves uh, that can become very, very heavy and bring otherwise healthy tree branches down. These two, the arrowhead and the pothos, they're related to the elephant ear. They're in that same plant family that makes the oxalic acid crystals that burn and cut and you know, pulling this thing is going to expose your skin to those oxalic acid crystals and you too could become burnt and irritated. Um, one of the foliar herbicides that are sprayed directly on the leaves of many plants to kind of shut down photosynthesis rolls right off these species. They, they just laugh at it. So pulling, spraying, not necessarily all that effective, um, other 
control measures have to be used or have to be investigated or the control measures that we have just need frequent application in order to keep those two from getting established. The coral vine was kind of new to me. I grew up in Clearwater. I grew up in Pinellas County. I went to college in Tennessee and got to see a whole different flora. Went to North Carolina, ended up working around the world and came back. But I don't remember coral vine, even though I was kind of tuned into a lot of plants when I was a little kid, weirdo. Um, I don't remember coral vine. But now I see it everywhere. And you can buy it in a bucket on a heart-shaped trellis and it's got these pink flowers and it's just so cute and so romantic and so cottage garden and wouldn't that look lovely in the back growing on a trellis well the picture on the left here there was a garden shed there until the love vine got loose escaped from its bucket leapt off of its trellis and took off. I have seen someone, I go up and down Highland Avenue in Pinellas County quite a lot, and I saw that someone planted one of these at the base of a telephone pole because the telephone pole was in their yard and they didn't like looking at it. So why not put a pretty pink flower vine on this telephone pole and it'll grow up, it'll hide the telephone, ugly telephone pole. In one year, I watched the coral vine do just what the landowner anticipated. It grew up the telephone pole. And then it started to go across Highland on the telephone wire. Like a curtain was just drawing across Highland Avenue. It was that. You could almost watch it trip to trip you could see its progress so scary scary vine we'll finish up with some trees because believe it or not there are invasive trees including palms and then kind of the shrubby layer and again these are all plants that you can still buy um, we're just encouraging you not to and if you have these in your sphere of influence start thinking of ways to get rid of and if you have any influence on family members or friends, educate them. Don't yell at them. People don't react well to being yelled at. We've seen that over and over and over and over again. People don't like being yelled at. You get an opposite result. Educate with love. I've got a, one of these trees I rent in Dunedin now, and one of these trees found its way as a seed onto my landlord's property and it grew very fast and it produces these powder puff flowers and year round it sheds leaflets. So this leaf in the picture with the flower here, this leaf is actually composed of these tiny little units called leaflets. So one leaf is divided into little leaflets and it just drops these little leaflets year round. So they're always building up has this really insulting common name of woman's tongue. I don't know why. The seed pods, it's a legume, so the seed pods are actually beans, legumes, and they're long and they're flat and they're dry, and they split open and the, let the seeds go. Um, at one point, it was considered a very useful landscape plant because fast growing, evergreen, flowering tree. What more could you, doesn't get too big. You could plant it underneath a telephone or a power line. It's a small tree, so it provides shade in a short period of time. It flowers, it does all these wonderful things, but it has got loose and it is causing trouble. Another legume, another relative is the orchid tree. And this one probably wouldn't take too much convincing to go ahead and get rid of. The plants of the orchid tree that I have seen around Pinellas County all 
have, it seems that every single one of them has at some point in their life succumbed to particularly low temperature spell. You know, even if it's just one night below 40 degrees or one night a lot below 40 degrees, these things, the, the orchid trees, they hate it and they'll actually, you know, a third of their crown will die back and just, they don't even have to freeze. They just hate being that cold and it'll kill that, that much of their, and so the trees that I've seen of this around Pinellas County are kind of scraggly, snaggly, not really contributing much to the overall aesthete of a particular area. So if this is one that's in your sphere of influence and it looks kind of manky, go ahead and get rid of it because mentioned before, summers are getting warmer, summers are getting longer, things are getting wetter and warmer and wetter and warmer, and those can help est um, establish this plant as an invasive in our county as much as it has become in counties south of here. So this, this is a species that is already a problem south of here, but it's already got a toehold in Pinellas. So let's eliminate any seed source before conditions get to be perfect to get this orchid tree into the category of number one invasive. Australian pine, again, has a lot of check this box to make a perfect landscape plant. Evergreen, fast growing, shade tree, no disease, no pest, uh, can grow in sand, drought tolerant, sun tolerant, wind tolerant. Did I say salt as well? These are actually growing down at Fort DeSoto, salt spray, not touching them. Um, a very well-meaning committee decided to plant Australian pines on the beach at one of our county parks to prevent soil erosion. Well-meaning, not nefarious. Unfortunately, this decision was made in the absence of rigorous study, perhaps. Perhaps, I wasn't there. Um, turns out not only are they poor at stabilization, they can actually hasten erosion and redirect erosion. Um, and now the right decision was made to go in and get rid of the Australian pines at this county park. And they're cutting down trees and they have to be destroyed. How could anyone cut down a tree? That's the worst thing in the world. How could you cut down a tree? That is where education failed to get ahead of this land management effort. And instead of going in with an awful lot of education about Australian pines, they're disrupting our natural wildlife. They're, nothing will grow underneath them because they poison everything underneath them. They have toxin in their needles that kills, that keeps anything from germinating underneath them that isn't an Australian pine. So you get these spooky, silent, groves of Australian pine because you can't have any birds because there's nothing for them to eat and you can't have any lizards because there's nothing for them to eat because there's nothing but Australian pine. In the absence of the education, the crews went in to take the trees out and suddenly the county is killing trees. And that's the only message that got out. So again, y'all are going to be deputized to go and spread the word on just what it is about these invasive plants and why it's important to get ahead with education, inform yourself and spread that information. The camphor tree, beautiful thing, symmetrical, becomes really old looking and not very long because it's so fast growing, makes lots of 
juicy berries that feed lots of birds. You see where this is going. Um, camphor tree, they come up everywhere. Those juicy berries with the nice seed inside, plant, 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 plant. Every time one of those birds that's eaten the camphor berry, poop, there's another one. We even have a champion camphor tree. It's, this is an Asian species. This is not a native plant. This one's on Gulf to Bay. I remember seeing this when I was a kid. It's been there for so long. And sure, it has a really handsome silhouette. You know, people go here and they pray and they make sacrifices and they do all these things. And they're worshiping this not invasive, preserve destroying species. So, again... We missed it on the education here. And can you imagine if now we tried to go in and say this thing is cause this one plant is causing a huge problem in our county, a very expensive. Madam, you're paying probably $5 a week out of your taxes to go and kill all these things, kill this thing's offspring throughout the county. Not tenable, is it? So again, missed boat on education. So here we are. The carrot wood, we'll just go through these next pretty quickly. I'm sure you guys know all these. The carrot wood has that, again, a compound leaf. So the leaves are, are divided in these kind of elongated leaflets. It has these strange and showy sprays of uh, orange fruit. Again, it's a good bird plant because the birds love to eat the fruit. The birds can do just fine without carrot wood fruit. And when they do eat carrot wood fruit, they plant carrot woods wherever they fly. Fast growing, evergreen, no pest, drought tolerant, all the things. There's a reason this was brought into cultivation. But if it's looking kind of manky in your sphere of influence, now you've been deputized to make that decision. Let's get rid of it and replace it with something else. The Suridam cherry, boy oh boy, again, you can get yourself into a fight and we don't recommend that. Don't ever get into a fight. It's not worth it. Really, it really isn't worth it. Um, because people can eat the fruit of the Suridam cherry, despite the fact that there's plenty other fruit that you can get, you know, from the store for not very cheap and get your five a day and do just fine. Every once in a while, you can get a fruit or two off of a Suriname cherry that won't kill you and won't turn your mouth inside out. And so this plant has its defenders. If you have it in your sphere of influence, and if you can live without one fruit every couple of weeks, then we would recommend replacing it with something else. And if you can convince kindly, gently, with love and compassion and with education. No wagging fingers, none of that. People don't like that. Then you perhaps could explain that this species is actually getting loose in our natural areas. And even though it makes this nice big juicy fruit that might seem to us like a wonderful addition to a woodland, you know, the deer, they'll have something to survive on. They don't need it. They don't need it. They don't need this. They don't need the fact that this thing grows at the expense of what might be producing something else they need at a different time of year. It's a disruptor. It's not an enhancer. The species and all these invasive species are disruptors. They don't enhance natural areas. They disrupt. Schefflera. Both the giant one and the little yellow and green one, again, in every single Publix parking lot. These are flowering plants, the Schefflera. They do produce flowers, which in turn produce fruit, which are attractive to squirrels, possums, birds, and those become agents of dispersal to move those seeds into natural areas, causing, again, causing a disruption. So if you have one of these umbrella trees or the smaller version, the yellow and green, you see them everywhere. They're very widely available. They're very inexpensive because they're so widely grown 
there are billions of them in nurseries because they grow so quickly. Every single cutting roots, every single seed germinates. They're so cheap to produce. We can sell them for next to nothing and people can buy truckloads of them. This is how things, this is how they get established. Um, again, there's no regulation. It's not against the law to grow these plants. We just have to provide knowledge, reason, and within our, I'm going to say it again, sphere of influence, prevent their escape from our sphere of influence. Brazilian pepper doesn't need an introduction. You've all heard of it. What you might not realize is that it's not, well, obviously, it didn't originate in our wild areas where it's the biggest problem ever now. It wasn't introduced into Florida and placed directly into natural areas. That's not the story of the Brazilian pepper. It was used as a landscape plant. As all of these species have, this one again ticks all the boxes. Fast growing, evergreen, showy flowers, showy berries all winter long. Birds love it. You know, can plant under a power line, doesn't get too big, great everything, shade tree, blah, 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 all these things. And we all know what happened next. Loose, reseeding, and forming these monocultures, which means only one species is present. A monoculture is where only one species is present. A natural, well, a monoculture in a natural area is where a plant like Brazilian pepper tree has become established and has spread through root suckers and seedlings and has outcompeted through competition for water in the soil or just causing shade to fall on anything around it so that whatever it's growing over eventually dies from lack of sunlight. It's just brutalized and become a monoculture in the areas where it's become established. The Chinese fan palm, sadly, is a new addition to the 2019 list. Um, you know, we hate that new plants are being added, but of course they're being added. And plants that might have at one time been considered perfectly fine and Florida friendly end up on this list because some small change, if it's temperature, if it's water, over a period of five or 10 or 15 years, flips the switch and turns an otherwise benign non-native plant into an invasive non-native plant. And the Chinese fan palm, the switch flipped for this one, as did for the Senegal date palm. This is the one that's very often sold in multi-trunked. It's called Phoenix, is the genus, like the catch on fire bird, um, and Reclinata because the, the trunks tend to not grow straight up and down. They tend to recline a little bit. Again, very popular, fast growing. It gives you that tropical look. It's a palm tree, blah, 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 blah. But this one produces, it's a flowering plant. The palms are flowering plants and they produce the fruit which is in turn attractive to some wildlife. Remember, that's not enough. Just because it feeds some wildlife with its fruit doesn't, doesn't outdo the negative impact that it has on natural areas. So the Senegal date palm has found its way into our natural areas and has the queen palm. And a study was done and published by a friend of ours, uh, actually a herpetologist friend of ours, George Heinrich, did a study on what is the vector that is moving the queen palm from residential areas into our native areas. He, in particular, studies um, Boyd Hill Preserve in St. Petersburg, you know, completely surrounded by urban landscape. 
but something was bringing queen palm seeds into the preserve. And it was passing through their digestive system and it was becoming established and they were getting these queen palms established in Boyd Hill. And it turns out it was coyote. The coyote loved the queen palm fruit. And if you've got a queen palm in your sphere of influence, you probably know that they make, you know, for a palm, they make a pretty juicy berry. You know, the coconut is a pretty hard and not very juicy berry. The, the queen palm is much juicier. It has a fleshy exterior. That's how it's, its mode of transport is in the digestive system of something else. The coconut's mode of transport is the water, so it doesn't have to make any sweet, fruity reward. So it's the coyote, another not really native species that's just trying to survive and is moving the seeds of the queen palm. So what do we do about the queen palm? You can, when these plants, any of these palms that we mentioned, when they come into flower, they tend to flower on these huge um, sprays, if you will, these huge panicles of tiny white flowers. When it's in flower, if you take that whole inflorescence off before it has a chance to produce the fruit and go to seed, you just take all the flowers off, it can't reproduce itself. And you have stopped the production of those fruits and thus you have stopped the possibility of coyote taking a mouthful of those fruit and into the woods and passing them through the digestive system and planting them out there. So that's how you do your part. So again, not an exhaustive list of all the invasive plants in Pinellas County, but a heads up maybe. Hopefully there was a couple of plants on this list that you weren't aware were invasive. So what do we do about all these things? How can you know, how can you tell the difference between a native plant and a non-native plant? How, where do you get this information? Well, we've provided a link to the list of invasive plants, the FISC list. So you can study that on your own and it's a rabbit hole. You can go and click all the links next to the, next to the plant name and learn more about it, see pictures about it, get tips on how to tell it from another species. Um, how do you get rid of these things? Who can you ask? Who can you ask the best method for getting rid of these things? You know, you go to a garden center and ask for advice. They're not there to give you advice. They're there to sell you something. That's their job. Nothing wrong with that. It's called capitalism. You go to a lawn center and you all you want is some advice. That's not their job. What they're going to do is they're going to sell you something or they're going to tell you to do something that requires something that we have over here on the shelf. That is their job. They are not there to give you advice. Do you understand? I hope you're understanding me. I was in the industry. I know this. Where you turn for free advice from people who have nothing to sell, obviously no money to make from it, would be your extension service. That's who gives you the advice. That's who gives you the research-based information on the method, the timing, the product, the source sometimes of the method to eradicate the best time of year, the best product, when to call in the cavalry, when to give up, and you're never going to get rid of that. Learning how to live with a bad neighbor, invasive species, that sort of thing. Turn to your, that's what we're here for. Um, you can visit the Pinellas County Extension website. You can send very good photo, very good photographs. The best photographs that you've ever taken of any subject you can send to the Hort at PinellasCounty.org for help identifying and diagnos diagnosing. So all these services are available for free because it's what 
our job is. So instead of all these species that you can still buy, is there anything else that you can buy and plant? What are some alternatives? Turn to, again, Florida Friendly, which is a part of UF IFAS. There's a, a PDF. You could, if you have a couple hundred sheets of paper in your printer, you could print this thing out or just save it as a PDF and flip through it electronically. Um, it's the landscape guide, uh, plant selection and landscape guide. Now this is this one is 2015, and it's very important that when you become the student of Florida Friendly and your sphere of influence, that you cross reference. And if you see a plant in the plant selection and landscape design book from 2015, and look on the 2019 Fisk list, begonia is one that I can think of that is treated as a yay, great annual low maintenance plant selection, but has since the production of this guide been added to the category two. Nothing to worry about when you're talking about native plants. If a plant in the landscape design and plant selection book is labeled native, it's not ever going to be on the Fisk list. So native plant gardening, fantastic thing. Native to Central Florida, even better. Native to Pinellas County, better, 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 better. Some people spend their whole lives obsessed with nothing but natives, which is a great hobby. For more information on different groups of plants and for deeper dives into some of the individual species that we looked here today, we would like to drive you towards our YouTube channel. You just look for Extension Pinellas County or IFAS Extension Pinellas County or Pinellas County Extension. Somehow you know how to search. That's not what this class is about. Um, once you see our logo here, our, our orange and blue Pinellas County IFAS Extension logo on YouTube, you can spend an afternoon or two or three or eight going through our various playlists and videos. There's one playlist in particular that I'm near and dear to my heart. We did a long series called Florida Supernature last year in 2020 and did fun little 30 to 30 minutes to 60 minute segments on a whole bunch of fun topics. And we called it Florida Supernature. Coming up next in this format, we'll do what is algae on September 8th. What is algae? Better question, what are algae? And grammatically correct, what are algae? So join us September 8th and we'll answer, hopefully, the question, what are algae? Why do we hear about them in the news? Why do I know the word algae? We'll answer. So thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. You can reach me with any questions, comments, complaints, concerns, suggestions. Um, my email address has been right here all along, but here it is uh, in bigger uh, letters. I see we have some chat. I see we have some Q&A. So if you have to go, thank you very much for joining us. We're going to get to some questions now. Thanks for joining us hitherto. I'm just going to take a quick drink of water and open the Q and A. So Mitchell has been waiting very patiently since before we even began to find out whether or not we have the awful amaranth. We do have a couple of awful amaranths here. Um, I'm not quite sure if I know the particular awful amaranth that you're thinking of. Some of these are called puncture weed. Some of these are called hog weed. Um, the amaranths, the goat's foot, the chinopodes, all these together. Um, were introduced as fodder. You know, back in the day, Agriculture was king and we had, there was lots of research being done about what can we grow to make our cows fatter in a shorter amount of time. And tests were conducted um, 
species were introduced and some escaped from cultivation. So not all of our non-native invasive plants are pretty. A lot of them are because they were brought into cultivation because they were pretty. Some have arrived, some of the, especially the grasses, a lot of the invasive grasses were brought um, in the hopes that they would make our cows fatter in a shorter amount of time. They didn't make our cows fat, they did get loose and they did cause a problem. So we may have the awful amaranth that you're thinking of, but remember that Florida is in three distinctive parts. The panhandle is one part that has its own climatic zone. Central Florida has our own climatic zone and South Florida has its own. South Florida is tropical. The panhandle is temperate. Temperate means hot, cold, winter, summer. I mean, sorry, yeah, winter, summer. Tropical means always hot, but wet and dry, wet season, dry season. And here we in Central Florida, we have a little bit of both. We are cold and dry, hot and wet. So we're temperate influenced and tropical influenced. And each one of these areas are gonna have their own complement of floristic invaders. Some are particularly adapted to all three, but we're just talking here mostly about Central Florida. And that awful amaranth is probably one from a temperate area. How do you get rid? Okay, are we gonna? Yeah, pigweed. Pig, I, I, I might have said hogweed, pigweed. Yes, that's yes. Um, panhandle problem. Um, how do you get rid of any of these things? That would be the question for your local horticultural extension agent. I'm in the job, I'm in the business of identifying and the horticulturists are more in the how to grow, how to kill, how to grow, how to kill. I identify, they grow, they kill. So if you want the latest, I don't keep up with the latest, greatest eradication. I, li I live and work on a preserve, so I just observe. You can tell I'm trying to dodge this question, can't you? Um, not something I focus on. I trust the experts with mechanical, which means which could mean pulling, could mean mowing, could mean tilling under, which means you use large blades and actually bury these things. Herbicides, a foliar application of one or more herbicides at a particular interval during a particular time of year. All of these can work together, but the timing and the frequency of repetition would be dependent on the particular species you're trying to eradicate. It's not as simple as just, I'll go out there and I'll get rid of all those weeds and it'll be done forever. That has never happened. Never, never happened. The name of the beetle that is eating the um, air potato is the air potato beetle, handily enough. Um, Lilocereus chinii is the scientific. Lilocereus, one word, Lilocereus, Lilocereus, Lilocereus. The beginning of that name, Lilo, is for the lily lily beetle, air potato lily beetle, Lilocerus chenii, or air potato beetle. How can you recognize the plant? I think, I think Seven wants to know, how do you recognize pothos? Um, pothos is pretty distinctive in its I'm going to say large, maybe the size of your two hands put together, heart-shaped, glossy, apple green with yellow marbling. 
yellow stripes, yellow marbling. It's pretty distinctive, the pothos. And pigweed, great. Um, that's our Q&A. Again, I appreciate y'all uh, sticking around for a little bit of extra time. It's now 3.20. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again for joining us. I hope that the information has made sense and that you can go forth now educated, maybe learn more, maybe share some of the information that you've gained here today. Maybe ask more questions. There's always more to learn. Thanks for joining us and we will see you next time.